stories uh, about food, <laughs> from feast to famine. How many of you, just be honest, you just love food? Yeah. I love food. I mean, I re- anybody that knows me knows I love food. I-, I was a foodie before the term ever got popularized. That's no joke. I mean, I love food. I love all kinds of food. I love everything except liver. Because I, I, I had to eat it when I was a kid because it was cheap. Nobody told me that, you know, oh, yeah, by the way, that's the organ in the cow that filters all the toxins and poisons. But it's got a lot of iron. <laughs> but it was cheap, and we had to eat it. And I gagged every time, and I came up with creative ways to get rid of it. So I would, you know, I'd cut, cut the liver into pieces, and then I'd say, may I go to the bathroom? Yeah, and then I'd go. <laughs> flush it down the toilet. And, that's, and if there was a dog, man... I'd, Hated, 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 still hate liver. There's a strong connection between food and faith. There is throughout Scripture. You know, uh, Ryan did a great job last week and Brandon the week before, you know, just talking about God setting up a garden, a place that would provide for the, the, the physical appetites of man and, and women. And, and from there, you go all the way through Scripture and you see food and you see feasting. You see consequences of eating the wrong food. You see the medicinal properties of, he, uh, of eating foods that heal. Uh, you, you see, you know, the Last Supper, you see um, fellowship, you see Acts chapter 2, normal, normal Christian life, they're eating together, you know, all cum- accumulates at the very end with the marriage supper of the Lamb, where that's going to be a feast of all of God's children throughout all the ages, man, and there is, and my prediction is there's going to be food from every nation there, that's my prediction, and probably a lot of Thai food, which is my favorite food, I love Thai food, Thai food is it, it is the bomb uh, yeah, love Thai food. So, you know, you think about evidence of the spiritual life. What does he say? The evidence of the spiritual life, the Apostle Paul said, was that you would express the fruit of the Spirit. Isn't that interesting? He uses food, food speak there. And then you think about Jesus, you know. Jesus said, I have eagerly, now think about it. this is Jesus now. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Isn't that interesting? Before the betrayal and before the cross, what was on Jesus' mind? A significant meal with food and close friends. You know, I I can live without a lot of stuff in this life. Don't take away friends and don't take away food. And if it was important, in G- to Jesus, and it was on Jesus' heart before he died, I'd say it's pretty significant, wouldn't you? I, I mean, I-, I think it's like a big deal. Throughout Scripture, you see God speaks through prophets and priests and kings, and you go, yeah, of course, yeah. But then, he, you know, God also communicates through food. How many food metaphors there are in the Bible? 200 times in the gospel, food and eating meals together is mentioned. Throughout Scripture, you know, well over a thousand times, meals, food, bread. And so we're going to just talk about the communication uh, and, how, and how food communicates. Now, I've been in, in 23 countries so far. Um, I don't know how many countries there are. How many countries are there? Does anybody know that? Huh? Around 210. Okay, so i got a ways to go, but I've been to 23 of them. And I can tell you this, that in every country I've been to, food is significant, and it's important. And it's important not just for daily sustenance. It's important because it's about community, and it's about family, and it's about relationships. And how you treat the host country's meals and food prep will tell them whether you accept them or not. I'll just tell you, if you go on the mission field, the worst thing you can do in another country is if they serve you something and you go, in the best American voice you can go, oh, what is that? You have just closed the door to the gospel. If you go to another country and they serve you whatever they serve you and you got a big smile on your face and you start eating it, they love it. In fact, you know what most countries will do? I, I won't say most. A lot of the countries I've been to will, they'll even sacrifice, I mean, sometimes up to a month's wages to make you, the foreigner, a special meal. And you know what they'll do when they're preparing you food? They'll set it in front of you, and they'll stand and let you eat before they eat. And they'll watch you. 
They'll just watch you, which I don't care. I mean, it's like, I'm going to eat the way I'm going to eat. When I eat, I make noises. My, yeah, my wife, you know, and she has to dial me down because I, I so love and appreciate food and a good meal that I'll just, I'll, I'll grunt. I mean, I'll, this is what you would hear. If I'm eating, this is what you will hear. You will hear, oh, gee, that is incredible. Oh, and I won't stop with that. I mean, almost every bite I'll say something. I'll go, oh, God, this is amazing. Oh, oh, and I'll groan and I'll grunt. I'll make these noises. And then there'll be a second voice which is my wife, and she'll say, honey, okay. You know, it's just a hamburger. <laughs> Dial it down. But she's not there in the other countries. So I was like, oh, mm, oh, oh. And you know what the people will be doing? They'll be lighting up. And, and, so, and so what may be socially offensive in this country is a badge of honor in another country. And so I would just, ma- I'd be a noisemaker, man. I-, I would just like, oh, oh, that's it. But here's the problem with that. Once they know you like their food, they don't stop. And they just keep bringing it out. And it's like, and, and nobody told me how to politely say no mas. <laughs> nobody did. So I just keep eating. And they keep bringing it. But they keep feeling better. And they're more honored. And, and guess what? Do you think the gospel and do you think prayer is a little easier to do at that point? Hands down. Hands down. Uh, Tuesday, Robbie and I leave for Malaysia and Thailand, and then he comes home, and then I go to Greece. And I will tell you, in all three of those countries, food is a big deal. And I was in Malaysia, and we ate at different Muslims' home. In fact, we're getting there after Ramadan, where they fasted for 30 days, and so now they enter into a period of feasting. Oh, not going to be good for me, man. I mean, seriously, because I want to reach them. I want to love them, which means I'm going to eat, and I'm going to eat a lot, and I'm going to keep eating, and they're going to keep being really appreciative of the fact, and I will gain some weight. I'm not even kidding. Pray for me. Can you pray for me, please? I would really appreciate it. Um, one time, I was, I was in the Philippines, and... Uh, and I'm teaching this Bible study. And then all of a sudden, it's at night, and I hear this faint, faint sound. And I'm like, and I stop. I go, what is that? And everybody lit up. They got so excited. I thought, what is that? There's a guy with like a wheelbarrow full of eggs going down the road, yelling, Balut! Balut! And so they got really excited, and so they went and bought some of these eggs. Now, these eggs, I got to tell you, are duck eggs that they bury in sand, and they, the, the duck slowly develops and dies. I know, it's sad. It, it's, it's sad, but here's what it looks like. So once again, you're an American in another country, and you made the mistake of saying, what's that? And they bring you this. And what are you going to say? Ew! Call PETA. So I ate the yellow part. The yellow part is the yolk part. And then there was these girls there, and you know what they said? It's really good for your knees. <laughs> I said, my knees are just fine. <laughs> they really are. I said, you eat the rest. And they ate, and there's the crunching sound of a little developed duck. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Strengthening the knees of Filipinos. <laughs> brutal. It's brutal. And so I ate that little yellow thing, and... It was cool, I guess. Um, here's three things food communicates. And this could be pretty simple, but I just, you know, let's take a look at this. The first thing food communicates is, is fatherhood, the fatherhood of God. It reveals the paternal heart and the intimacy of God. And I want to just look at Matthew 7, which is, you know, I don't know if you can say Jesus' most important sermon, but it is his inaugural 
Magna Carta, if you will, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it's where he really establishes the ethics of the kingdom. Uh, it's really the important teaching that, that moves people from an exterior obedience, external obedience, to now everything you do is not just a sin of action when you sin, but it's a sin in the heart. He ups the ante. He, he says things like that. You have, you have heard that, you know, you shall not commit adultery. And, and right then people would be going, oh, good, check, glad I haven't done that. You know, I'm obedient. And he says, but I tell you, oops, Jesus throws that little thing in. But I tell you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery in his where? Heart. So he does that a lot of different thing, times. He just he takes that external compliance and makes everything an issue of the heart. So it's a big deal. When he gets to the end, it's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Matthew 5, he talks about the, you know, the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are those that, blessed are those that. And, and, and really that's uh, really just telling about what a, a heart change from God looks like and how it will act. And then he gets to Matthew 7, and he talks about reconciliation. He talks about a lot of great stuff. But he talks about prayer. How many of you think prayer is probably pretty important as a believer? I think, yeah. Um, Matthew 7, verse 7. You've read this many times. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone that asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now, and we know that the ask and the knock and the seek is all present tense imperative, you know, which means it's, it's like right now and it's continuous and it's ongoing. And so when, whenever I've heard this preached, I mean, most of the time, I'm not going to say every time, but most of the time I've heard those verses preached, it's along the lines of this. You got to be persistent in prayer. You got to keep on asking. You got to keep on pounding heaven's door. You got to keep praying harder. You got to pray harder. You got to press through. You got to keep going after it. And eventually, if you ask enough and if you seek enough and if you knock enough, God will tap out and just give you what you want. And, and, and it gets reduced to a formula that this is the formula that is really going to get prayer answered. And you know what hits me about this? This really has nothing to do with the formula because prayer is not transactional. It's relational. It's not contractual. It's covenantal. It's not about formula. It's about family. Now just watch this. This hopefully can change the way you pray. And then some people, you know, I didn't get an answer prayer. Well, maybe I just didn't ask that next time. Maybe I just didn't seek, seek, I just didn't knock hard enough. You ever hear people like that? You ever said stuff like that? I'm telling you, it's not about how, how hard you knock. In fact, I'm not even sure. Correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't even really think about this, but is there? I don't think there's a scripture that says pray harder. Anybody? Maybe there is. I'm not saying there isn't, but may, I don't think there is. Night and day, continuously, in everything, with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Yeah, continual prayer. I don't, I don't see where it says, pray harder, grunt more. I, I don't think. If it is, send me an email or something and just say, oh, yeah, Pastor, here it is. Good. I would love to know that. You see, what's the gospel? The gospel is we did nothing. We had nothing to offer. We were unable to obtain any righteousness or justification in and of ourselves. We had nothing. In fact, the state we were in, according to Ephesians 2, is you were dead, and you were dark, and you were lost, and you were without God, and you were without hope. Now tell me, if somebody lives in that state, what you have to offer God. You got nothing. You got nothing. You got no righteousness. You got no ground to stand on. The gospel is, but God, who is rich in his mercy, made us alive. You're alive. If you're a Christian, if you're alive today, it's because Jesus said, Come forth, O dead person. And you simply listened, and you responded, and you walked that way, and you're alive right now. So I'm going to get to what the, the, the continuous asking, seeking, and knocking is about. But make no mistake, it's not about formula. 
Verse 9, or what man is there among you? If his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? I mean, duh, of course, right? Verse 11, if you then being evil, what's he saying? If you then, as people that are separated from God, remember, these are people that are coming to Jesus, some for the first time, sitting down to listen to his teachings. If you then being evil, if you then being separated from God, if you then being carnal, if you then just being a natural person, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? In other words, why would you assume God is any different than the best of you? Which, of course, they would have to agree with. You see, those verses right there is really about parental love. Not about a formula. Not about a transaction. It's about the father heart of God. What happens in a family? A lot of things. But isn't it true that in every family, there is an ongoing repetitive asking and receiving. Isn't that true? Husbands ask wives to do something, ask their kids to do something, kids ask their mom to do something, kids ask their parents to do something. We, we, family asks of each other because it's relational. Isn't that true? What happens in friendships? The same thing. In close friendships, see, if you're my friend, okay, if we're friends, I will ask things from you. Is that a warning? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> depending on how you interpret it. No, if we're friends, at some point, I'm going to ask you to pray for me. I'm going to ask you to encourage me. I'm going to ask you to buy me a cup of coffee. I'm going to ask, I'm definitely, if you have a truck, about three times a year, I'm going to borrow it. <laughs> I, I'm, just, that's, I'm just giving you the heads up here. If I'm at your house and you have food, if you don't offer me food, I'll help myself. <laughs> Isn't that rude? No, that's not rude. That's what friends do. <laughs> you come to my house, go for it. If you come to my house and we're friends, I will always, always make you a latte. I will. If you come over, the first thing I will say is, you want a latte or you want a coffee? And I will do it. I, that, that's, you know, food is my love language. But I also like giving and watching other people. I'm hoping when I make them a latte, they do what I do. Oh, mm, Bob. Oh, this is great. This is me. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> no, but, but friends, friends ask. Is that true? Friends ask friends for things. And I would expect the same thing for you, from you. If I'm your friend, I would expect at some point, we're not friends so that you would do things, or I would do things, but I would just expect it because it's natural. If, if, if I have money and you need money, I'll let you borrow it. When I go on mission trips, typically, I'll give my car and let somebody who has a car that's busted or something like that drive my car. No big deal. It's, it's really no big deal because that's what friends and family do. There's no uptightness about giving and receiving at all if you're friends. You know, I grew up in an area when your close friends, they just walked in your house. Most of the time, they didn't even knock. Every now and then, you would get a bam, and then they're, they're in. They're in. Times have changed. What hasn't changed is people that are close give and receive. It's just natural. So what he's talking here is you need to see God different. He's not a withholding deity that's hoping you get your prayer formula right. He's a loving father that's very natural to give you what he has. If, here's the caveat, if it's good for you, don't assume what you ask for is good for you. James talks about that. Book of James. You have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask amiss. You miss it. So that you can consume what you ask on your own lusts. Remember, he goes into that whole presumption thing. So I'm not going to assume, and you shouldn't either, that you really know what you need. 
What I do assume is God knows what I need. And sometimes there's a little discrepancy. <laughs> sometimes I really think he, he quite, doesn't quite get what I need here. <laughs> but I've learned to relent. What a, I'll tell you, that is contentment. That's how contentment is spelled. You don't go willy-nilly asking God for this, that, and the other thing. You say, God, what do you want me to pray for? God, what do you, what do you want me to have? That's just good. But he's, a, he's God. He's a great father. You know, when, when I go to, go to Malaysia and go to these other countries, I, I ask them, what can I bring? I get to bring two suitcases this time. So one missionary has put on a few pounds. So <laughs> I'm bringing him some healthy bars to help him lose a few pounds. And I asked the wife, I said, what can I bring? What, what is something that you wish you had that you don't have access to? She said, sweethearts and Hershey Kisses. <laughs> so your prayer for me is that those items make it there. Yeah, <laughs> you get it. My wife gets it. She's like, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I said, well, what else? What else do you need? I said, well... One of our daughters really craves mac and cheese. No problem bringing mac and cheese. The other one, it's a little more difficult. Chef Boyardee ravioli. <laughs> I only got 50 pounds to work with here. But once again, what, it's, just, it's, a, it's a delight to provide for friends in need. See God like that. Look at Luke 11, verse 1. Once again, more about prayer. I don't know why I'm staying here, but I'm staying here. We need it. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Boom. That's a big deal. Teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, okay, now stop. This is the first time his disciples are asking him to teach them about prayer. Isn't it true Jesus could have taught them anything? I mean, this is, the ball is teed up. Disciples want to know how to pray. They have watched Jesus habitually disappear into solitary places and pray to God, and when he comes down, wild things happen. You know what they want? They want action. They want, you know what? Teach us to pray like you pray, so what happens with you when you pray happens through us when we pray. That's solid. That's rock solid. But, but I always go to, Jesus could have taught them anything. Okay, now when you pray, assume this posture, you know, say this about the power of God, the greatness of God, the omnipotence of God, the omnibenevolence of God, you know, all these kinds of things. But I want you to see the one word Jesus says, first off, first pitch, what does he say? When you pray, say, where'd it go? Okay, you guys are being funny back there. That's, come on, hit that button. Go to the next slide. Come on, somebody. Nope. <laughs> Maybe it's not on there. Maybe it's my bad. <laughs> no Luke 11 one? Is there no Luke 11 one? There's not. My bad. I humbly apologize. You should have interpreted it, though. You should have been led by the Spirit and said, he's going to need Luke 11 one but you didn't. You'll have another shot. <laughs> when you pray, say, Father. You know what I was thinking? I was thinking, if somehow you were out in the middle of nowhere, you didn't really know much about God, and there was a torn piece of the Bible, and, and it just ended after Father. Right there, just stopped. That's all you had. I think that would be enough. I think that would be enough to guide your prayer life. When you pray, say, Father. The key, not in the formula, the key is in the relationship. Now, once again, if you come from a family where dad was not good, dad was not there, dad was abusive, dad was authoritative, okay, that skews this a little bit. You may have to use your imagination. You may have to look to models that had good dads, I mean, that, that really balanced the love and the affection and the discipline that was appropriate, that was there all the time, that gave good sound advice, that was redemptive when, when the kids, you know, chose to go astray or whatever. You know, when you wrap your head around that, 
Prayer just becomes just kind of easy. It's kind of natural because you know he, he has what's best for you. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, this is where a lot of Americans can really get hung up. We don't have a concept of, of the whole daily sustenance things because there's an abundance in this country. You know, we, I mean, you're, I would say probably 98% of you, your cupboards are loaded. Um, I would say probably 75% have a refrigerator in the garage. I would say a high percent have racks in the garage with dried foods and different things. Am I right? You're not in trouble. Nobody's in trouble. You got that look like, oh, God, am I going to admit this? And What's he going to do then? No, it's, it's, okay. it's okay. I do too. I, I, I do too. But we don't, we, it's so far removed that we, you know, a, a lot of other countries, they just really, they buy what they need for the day or maybe a couple of days. But isn't it interesting that Jesus is talking about prayer and he says, give us this day our daily bread. He didn't say, give us today three cartfuls of Costco stuff and store it up in the garage. He didn't say that. Um, it's interesting because our walk with God is about a daily walk with him, a daily provision from him. It's all daily, daily presence with him. Don't think Costco. Think the children of Israel in the Exodus. Forty years, God provided daily. Daily. Manna from heaven. You know what happened when they tried to store it up? They said, you know what? This is good. Let's just, let's keep a bunch of this. Let's have excess. Let's save for a rainy day. You know what it says? Worms. Worms came and devoured it. That's amazing to me. Because we just think, well, store up, store up, get ahead, keep a bunch. He says, give us this day our daily bread. You know, I've seen people that they have a lot and they store a lot, so much so that they have storage shelters to put all their excess stuff, but there's no equating that to contentment. Just telling you, just saying. I've seen countries, though, where every day they got to go walk and they got to get water, and it takes them a couple hours a day just to get water to put in a container on their head and get back and they are peace and in pretty good shape just a thought there and then I once again I don't know why I'm camping on this here be careful about just demanding from God um remember the children of Israel they got sick of the the, the food from heaven it says that they complained let me just say that's always bad in fact, in Numbers, I can't remember how many plagues there are in the book of Numbers. It's, I want to say 10 or 13, or 13, and out of the 13, 10 were related to sins of the tongue. And a whole bunch of people died. Anyways, um, <laughs> look it up for yourself. God paid attention to their complaining, but the children of Israel go into this mode where they go, we want meat. Give us meat. <laughs> I like meat. I get it. <laughs> But they demanded, and they complained, and they grumbled, and they said, give us meat. And you know what God did? God said, you want meat? I'll give you meat. And it says, and they had so much meat, it was coming out their nostrils. They were snorting meat. <laughs> Unbelievable. It was coming out their nostrils. It was stuck between their teeth. Because they demanded. <laughs> okay, you didn't like that one? Okay, fine. <laughs> I like that. that. That's a reminder, man. Don't get pushy with God. Oh, I've heard, you hear bad teaching sometimes. You hear people, well, you just storm into the throne room of God. You ask him what you want. It's like, oh, shut up. Just stop. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. Will you be content with what God gives you today? Pretty weak. That's very weak. 
Will you be content with what God gives you today? Or you can complain. You can complain. Go ahead and and thank you. Exactly. All right, let's, let's move on a little bit. Bread. Let's talk about, oh, no, okay, real quick. Notice the sequence here. Father, kingdom, bread. He starts with paternal, he goes to powerful, and then provisional. That's a great sequence. Now, he feeds the multitude, John 6, feeds 5,000. In John 6, and this is your homework. In fact, you know what I was thinking? You should go home and meditate on Matthew chapter 6 and John chapter 6. Those two chapters are really powerful. John chapter 6, Jesus tees up his deity by feeding 5,000. You know, loaves, takes a few loaves, fishes, breaks them, blesses them, distributes them, everybody eats, satisfied. But then he goes and he moves into who he is. And this is powerful. Verse 48, John chapter 6. I think you have this one. Thank you. Let's read this together. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Who's the bread of life? Jesus. Bread. He's food. That's awesome. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Why? Because bread sustains life. And he said, I am the living bread. Verse 51. I am, clear reference to Exodus chapter 3. Who should we tell them? Sent them. Say the I am. Ooh, same language. The I am. Jesus now is asserting I am deity. I am God. So he'll make that statement seven times in the book of John. I am the living bread. Where would it come from? Came down from heaven. Whoa, it's the picture of the Exodus. And then remember what the people said, don't have time to go into it, but the people said, Moses provided for the people manna from heaven. Now Jesus is saying, okay, that's good. That's really great. Guess what? I'm the living bread, came down from heaven. This is what really torques the Jews. When he says this, they spool. They unravel on him. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the, for the life of the world. When he says, I'm the living bread, it means I am the active, alive, blessed, and endless sustenance of the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, I'm sustainable for life. When are you really living when you're connected to the bread of life? What's most sin? What's most addiction? It's a disconnect. It's eating the perishable things of the world. Jesus, I am the living bread that came down. You know what's interesting? And it's amazing. If you take a bag of flour and you take some water, and that's all you consumed, you'd last a little while. You would. But isn't it interesting that if you take the same flour and the same water, and you make bread out of it, you can live indefinitely. Isn't that interesting? And Jesus says, I'm like that. I can sustain you through every aspect of your life every season of your life, if you'll simply partake of me. Um, I'm going to skip two. I'm going right to three. Can you do that? I think so. Here's the other thing I wanted to connect. That food communicates the faithfulness of God. God uses food to remind us of his faithfulness. Um, In Mark 8... He talks again about um, bread. The disciples have a little problem. They leave the feast. They gather up fragments. They they gather up leftover loaves. They're getting to go in a boat, and they're going to go do ministry somewhere else, and they forget their bread. Okay? They have an ADD moment. I don't know what it was. They forgot their bread. And all of a sudden, they got preoccupied and anxious about the one loaf that they did remember. And they started worrying. And Jesus says to them, beware and watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. And they said, well, is it because we we say that we don't have any bread? Okay, so they're, they're missing the whole moment. 
So, so what is the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod? It's, it's rising unbelief. It's, it's habitually testing Jesus to prove who he is, but not being satisfied with any proof that he gives them. It's that now, okay, you did that, show me this. Okay, you did that, show me this. All the while, their heart's hard, and they really don't want to know if he's God or not. They're testing, they're tempting, they're provoking. And then Jesus says, you're anxious about this little loaf of bread and what you forgot, you don't even get it. And look what he says, I love this. What a great, what a great challenge right here. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? And having eyes you don't see and ears you do not hear and do not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000. Don't you remember? This wasn't a long time ago, guys. Don't you remember this? And you know what the key, the, the, here's the whole key. He says, when I broke. Whose hands were the loaves in to feed the multitude? What's the key to all provision? What's the key to getting out of lack? What's the key to living in an abundance as God would define it, not as you want it? It's you take whatever you have, the little you have, and you put it in his hands, and you watch what he does. You let him do his thing. You don't hold on to it. You don't say, well, this is all I got. I got to hang on. No, 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 no. You live generously, whether you have a lot or you have a little. That's how the kingdom works. King and doesn't say, well, get ahead, get everything paid for, get a good bank account, get your retirements, and then give. Doesn't say that. No, 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 no. No. And he's challenging these guys. Hey, and he goes, five loaves, 5,000. How many, how many full baskets, broke a pe broken pieces did you take up? They said 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets, broken pieces did you take up? They said seven. And he said, don't you understand you know, you know what he was saying? This is Jesus math. This is a math lesson, kids. And here's the new math, okay? AD 37. Here's the new math. The new math is five loaves feeds 5,000, and you have 12 leftovers. That's new math. Well, that doesn't really compute. Yeah, I get it. It's kingdom. Kingdom doesn't compute all the time. But then he, he says, okay, how about the seven for the 4,000? How much did you have left over? Seven. Okay, seven loaves, 4,000, seven left over. You imagine if you're doing a story problem nowadays. <laughs> a man had five loaves and fed 5,000 people, and there was 12 left over. Oh, no, stop. I can't even do it. I cannot do a story problem. But this is story problem with Jesus right here. And you know what he's saying? Okay, thousands and thousands were fed. And you're worried because you have one loaf? If five feeds seven with the leftover of this and the other feeds that and there's a leftover of that, there's 12 of us in a boat here and you can't equate one loaf with possibly feeding 12 mouths? I was horrible at math, but I can get it. I get that one. Oh, gosh. <laughs> unbelievable. I'm unbelievable. This is looking in a mirror for me. The leftovers are a reminder of the care and abundance of God. You know, John 6, 6, sex. <laughs> John 6. <laughs> Low blood sugar. I got to eat. Um, <laughs> In John 6, after the miracle, he says, pick up the fragments. Now listen, if you got a guy that's multiplying a little bread and a couple of fish and feeding thousands, why, are, why do you care about a few fragments that are left? And why does he say, pick them up and take them with you? Because he wanted them to have a reminder of who he is and what he did. So let me ask you a question. What reminders do you carry around in your life that remind you of when Jesus did great things for you?
I mean, think about that. What do you carry around? I'll tell you one thing you carry around. You carry around a story. I'm just going to ask you a question. How many of you, and, and don't fudge, don't say, well, I'm in church, I should raise my hand on this. No, let me ask you this. How many of you, as you look back over your life, have seen at least one time where you know God miraculously, miraculously provided for you? It was a God. Now, just hold your hand, lock the elbow, and look around. And it wasn't like I got another credit card and that took care of it. I'm talking about God. God did it. You carry that. You carry that story. You carry that testimony. Let's stand up together. You carry that with you. You know what else you carry with you? You carry prayer. You carry prayer with you. You know, what is communion? Communion is the tangible, unleavened bread and juice or wine that is done as often as we do it to do what? Remember. Spiritual amnesia is rampant in the church. I, I, think, I think because we're so busy and we're in such a rush and we move so fast. I mean, it's interesting. We live in a fast food culture. You know, in a lot of countries, they don't even understand that. You, you, you go to a little place, you get food, and then you go and you eat in the car. They don't get it at all. Because food for most countries is really about connecting with family and bonding. And they would say, why would, you, why would you take something that's so powerful to unite people as a family and cheapen it with just scarfing it down as fast as you? Why would you do that? And no meal prep? You wouldn't know. What? Wow. So let's, 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 let's pray about a couple of things here. Um, I don't think God wants, I mean, he's, you know what else he's after with those disciples is a scarcity mentality. If you're connected with God as father, there never will be lack. There, there just won't. Some people have a scarcity mentality. Um, I had a couple come in years ago, and here was their big issue. So what's, what's the problem? She says, I find little jars and socks full of money all around the house. Mm, what's the problem? My husband puts money in little jars and hides them. I said, okay, do you do that? He goes, yeah. I said, well, how many little jars and socks full of money are stashed around the house? He says, I have no idea. So okay, this might be a good problem to have. <laughs> I said, how much do you think you have? He goes, I don't know, probably one to two thousand dollars. I said, so why do you do that? And he said, because I was raised in a home and we were very poor and we didn't eat every day. And when I grew up like that, I made a vow. I will never put my family through that. And so he stashed money all over his house. He, she, she didn't know, and he forgot where he stashed everything. <laughs> I said, well, go have a scavenger hunt. Man. Have a fun time, man. Go, I found some money. <laughs> but, but here's the problem with that. I, I get where he's coming from, don't you? That, that makes sense. But the problem is that was motivated by fear and anxiety, not faith and trust. Yeah. Got it handled. They're good. I want to pray a couple things. Bow your head, close your eyes. I just want to ask this question. And I would like prayer team members to come forward and be ready to pray. But I want to ask this question. <clears throat> How many of you would say there's a little bit of a disconnect in your walk with God and how you view God? That it's, it's, it's a little difficult for you to see God really as a father and a good father and a loving father. That's my first question. Would you slip your hand up and down? I just want to see who that's for, okay? Got it, got it, got it, got it. I will say I've wrestled with that also, okay? And here's the second thing. I, I just wanted to ask, how many of you would say you do tend to lean towards a scarcity mindset? Just raise your hand. You know, you just got fear, don't have enough, not going to have enough. Go ahead, hold your hands up. I just want to see, look around. Okay, got it, got it. Okay. 
This is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, we know he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we ask of him. I can tell you that it is God's will that you see him and know him as a loving father. I can tell you that. That is God's will. The second thing is, I can tell you, it's not God's will that you run through this life fearful, worried, and anxious that you don't have enough, that you will never have enough. I can just tell you that right now. So let's go ahead and just take those two out right now, okay? Hold your hands out. Surrender. Open hands. Don't clench. So, Father, I pray you can do what I could never do. You can give people a revelation of your Father heart, who you are. The love, the grace, the compassion, the provider, the one who's willing to delegate his authority to his people, the one who lifts people up, one who generously heals people, provides. So I pray, God, whatever adjustment in the heart and the mind has to take place, God, I pray that you would do that. If there's healing that needs to take place, God, let there be healing. If there is uh, if there's woundedness, bitterness, resentments from people towards their earthly father, I pray they would address that. I pray they would invite you in to help them address that and heal that. God, and I pray for that, and I come against that scarcity mindset. I come against the whispers of the enemy that would say, you're never going to have enough. You are going to live just like the home you were raised in. You're always going to struggle. You're never going to have enough. I pray, God, that you would adjust our prayer life. And we would pray, give us this day our daily bread. And God, would we let go of how we define what our needs are? And would we just trust you? Because you are the God of more than enough. I love the two words in that verse in Matthew 7. How much more? Everybody say much more. How much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask them? And so, Father, I pray for every person in here. I pray that they would have a turn in their heart and their mind, a repentance and a revelation, a turning to agree with you and your word and link to your character, your heart, and your nature in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. If you need prayer, get up here. The rest of you, church, you're dismissed. I love you. Have a great rest of the weekend.